Our scripture text for today comes from the 16th chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 13 through verse 34. So hear the word of God. I'll be reading from the New International Version. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak with the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul in silence and dragged them down to the marketplace to face the authority. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Father, thank you for these accounts of people who have had their lives changed, who were converted through faith in Christ. And now we invite you to speak to our hearts, clarify any doubts we may have, and give us a deeper appreciation for the wonderful gift of eternal life you have given us through your Son. Lord, speak to our hearts now. Open our minds, our hearts, and glorify yourself in the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Like me... You can probably think of things that you were told in your childhood, things that you can remember being rehearsed to you as if they were true, that later in time you would find that they weren't true, right? Things like girls are gross, not true. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me not true. Boys are gross, partially true, <laughs> right? A little bit of truth there. 
If you were a Jewish boy centuries ago, you would have grown up learning to pray a prayer as a boy, as a male. And that prayer would have sounded like this. Lord, I thank you that you did not make me to be a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. More on that in a few minutes. So far in the book of Acts, we have seen God is at work. The kingdom is growing. That Jesus' ministry formerly on earth is now from heaven on earth. And He has empowered what He calls His church, His people. He's empowered them with His word and with His spirit. And He says that my gospel will go forth in the earth from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost ends of the earth. Because God is doing something. And week by week, we're seeing some of what that is. And in the last few weeks, we've seen these conversions, these transformations of people, all kinds of people. And this morning, we're given by Luke, the author of Acts, three consecutive conversions in a row. And again, I know it was a long reading. But these are surprising conversions. These are amazing conversions. They are beautiful conversions that teach us not just about these people long ago. We actually learn something about ourselves, and we learn something about the church, and we learn more of what God is doing. You've heard the passage read. You've heard the three stories of conversion, and I just want to comment on those each Uh, briefly and separately, to see the beauty in them. My first point this morning is that conversions, don't forget, are surprising. Conversions are not expected. Conversions are God breaking in and doing a radical work of transformation in the life of a person. Young people can be converted. Old people can be converted. Human beings are converted. When my children were younger, they used to ask when we were going to bring our dogs or our cats to church to come and worship the Lord. And, of course, you have that conversation that church is the people of God gathering for worship. And I know there are some churches that will gather pets and do some blessings and things like that. We're not going to be doing that at Greenwood Presbyterian Church. We understand that God transforms human beings created in His image calling them to His worship and His likeness. Whether young or old or anything else, God is at work calling people, human beings, converting them and transforming them. And that is a radical reordering of the human person. Where suddenly, their values, their beliefs, the things that they treasure, the things that matter most to them, are redefined. Redefined by God Himself, revealed to us in His Word. We come to faith and obedience to His truth and to His authority. That's what it is to be converted. It's it's to let go of all those things you humanly treasure and to instead embrace the things that God says He treasures, which includes human beings but it's a giving up of our passions, our desires for the holy ones that the Lord would give His redeemed people. Francis Schaeffer on conversion and truth has this wonderful little quote I came upon this week. It says this, Christianity is not a series of truths in the plural, but rather truth spelled with a capital T. Truth about total reality not just about religious things. So if you're one who's like, okay, we're going to church today. I'm going to put on my religious cap. This is the religious me. I'll be about faith today, or at least for an hour today. And then I'll go back to the real me for the real world. Francis Schaeffer would remind us this morning, no, 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 no. Truth is truth. 
It's universal truth. It's God's truth. And that's what defines us. That's what reorders us. That's what repurposes us. Not one hour of one day of the week, but who we are through and through, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That's what it is to be truly converted. That's the kind of conversion that God does according to His Word and by His Spirit in Scripture. And that conversion... That conversion of a person, sometimes it is a long and slow and tedious process, right? Maybe think of your own story or people that you know. Sometimes this conversion, this reordering of a person, it's a long process. But in our passage, we have at least two instances of how that can be an instantaneous process. Either way, God is the author of it. And so consider yourself. Your story of coming to be a worshiper of Jesus Christ, is it a long process? A slow process? Maybe that you are still in the midst of. Or for you, was it sudden and clear and unquestioned? Or was it somewhere in between those two? All those possibilities of how God converts They're all evident in the passage this morning where we're given these three surprising stories of conversion. Now, point number two. God converts all kinds of people. He converts all kinds of people in His earth. We're given three examples of them this morning, and this is where we'll sit for the majority of our time. The first conversion in our story is the woman. Her name is Lydia. She's called Lydia. And in verses 13 through 15, we're given her little story, just in those few verses. Lydia is a businesswoman. She's a successful businesswoman who specializes in expensive purple dye. She is a well to do woman, and she is well put together. It says that she's a God-fearer, she's a worshiper, but that would not be a worshiper of Christ. She would be a Gentile God-fearer who believed and wanted to worship the God of the Old Testament, but had not yet identified Jesus as the fulfillment of all the promises of the Old Testament. But one Sabbath day, she goes to the river. Now, apparently there's not a place of worship. It took ten men to formally conduct a place of worship. And it's the women who seem to be showing up in number to gather for worship. And Paul goes there with Silas to teach and preach that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament promises. And they go there to gather with these Gentile worshipers and Lydia is there. So picture that, a few women, maybe a few men gathered by the river for what essentially is Sunday school, a small group. This is conversion by Sunday school and small group with some really clear teaching from the Apostle Paul. She hears Paul's message, and note that the text doesn't say, Paul was so effective and good and prepared in what he said, The Apostle Paul's outline was so clear that Lydia was converted. It doesn't say that. It says the Spirit opened Lydia's heart and she was converted. Right? Some of us put too much trust and confidence in working on outlines during the week that we forget it's the Spirit of God who bulldozes hearts and minds with the truth of the gospel. And that's what happened for Lydia here. She hears from Paul and her heart is opened by the Spirit of God. She becomes a believer and what immediately is connected with her belief. Again, as it's been throughout Acts, profession of faith and baptism. She's to be baptized and numbered among the worshipers of God who belong to the church. So she professes her faith, she's baptized. Then, it's interesting to me, immediately what it says she wants to do. 
She wants to practice hospitality. She wants to have these people in her home, these fellow Christians. She says, if you regard me to be in the Lord, if you regard me to be a believer, come to my home. And they didn't disagree with her. And so they fellowship together. And here we have the transformation of this well-put-together woman uh, through reasonable discourse, her coming to believe in who Jesus was. In just, what, three verses, a nice, clean, tidy conversion of a well-put-together person who just needed to hear the truth communicated and explained. And for some of you, that might be what your testimony sounds like. You grew up among faithful people, worshiping by the river, hearing true things, and at a young age, you were well put together, professed faith in Christ, never really ran into rebellion, don't have memories or hard stories of living in darkness, just kind of well put together like Lydia, successful all of your life. The kingdom includes people like that. Amen? Amen. Now we move to the second character in the story, who is not well put together, who is living in darkness, who is living in hardship, who is the opposite of Lydia. And guess what? These people are in the kingdom too. These people are in the church as well. This is the slave girl. Her story is recorded in verses 16 through 18. And if if Lydia came into the faith through this exposition of Scripture, this teaching of Scripture, this slave girl comes in through exorcism, the casting out of an evil spirit, which is literally what the passage says happened. The slave girl, what we know of her, is that she is in double bondage. She's in double bondage. She is in the bondage of an evil spirit, somehow supernaturally given powers to tell the future. She's clairvoyant. That's what the passage says. And she's in bondage to this evil spirit. But it's a double bondage because she's in bondage to men who are taking advantage of her taking advantage of her being a slave girl, taking advantage of her of having a spirit that enables her to be clairvoyant. And the passage says they're making much money from her. She's their meal ticket. And so she's in double bondage both to a demon and to selfish, self-loving men who are taking advantage of her profiting from her and using her for their own well-being. Meanwhile, she's following the Apostle Paul who's been teaching and preaching. She's following Paul around and saying true things. These men are trying to tell you the way of salvation. These men are telling you of Jesus Christ. And she says, it says that she does this for several days until Paul has had enough. And Paul turns to her and he exercises her. He casts out by his own authority given to him by Jesus. He casts out the evil spirit. And in an instant, in a moment, she is set free from that bondage. She's no longer in bondage to that spirit. And apparently she's set free from those men. And those men are not happy about it because they've lost their meal ticket. She no longer has that ability to do what was getting them money. And so these men are furious, and this would be the beginning of a spiraling situation with the Apostle Paul and with the Roman government, with his citizenship as a Roman citizen. But the girl is at the center of a conversion story. Now, some of you who've read the story are saying, no, wait a minute, the passage does not say that she's converted. It doesn't say, it doesn't use the word converted. Well, that's true, and it's been suggested by commentaries, and I think they're right. Look, this story of this slave girl is sandwiched 
right in between two stories of conversion. They're all given us together. The conversion of Lydia, and the third story we'll hear in a moment, the conversion of the jailer. Very clearly, Luke is giving this to us as a picture of how people are entering the kingdom of light, leaving the kingdom of darkness, being transferred from sin and its dominion into life in Christ. And so, surely it is a conversion. She's been converted from darkness to the freedom that Jesus offers. In the name of Jesus, she was cleansed of this evil spirit. So she's a sandwiched conversion in between these two very clear stories of profession of faith. And the third story of conversion is this jailer. Now this gets many more verses than those first two conversions, and there's much to learn here. This jailer would have been a roughneck, a tough guy, a physical guy, somebody who was able to control a situation. And the passage says that Paul and Silas, once they had exercised the demon from the slave girl, they were dragged into the marketplace, put before the magistrate, and then some very clever statements were used by those who had owned the slave girl to bring trouble into Paul's life. These Jews, they have stirred up the people. They're making us do things that are not in accord with our customs. That's enough to get the attention of the magistrate. And as you heard, they would have Paul and Silas beaten with rods, flogged, punished, and thrown into jail. Now, not just into jail, it says that they were thrown into the inner cell and that they were put in stocks. So Paul and Silas are in jail, in the inner cell, in stocks, and Luke goes on to tell us that they're also in song. They're singing while they're in jail, in the inner cell, and in stocks. Which if we just stopped there for a moment and applied that, if I was in jail, in the inner cell, in stocks, am I going to be in song? I think I'm going to be in complaint, probably pretty vocal complaint and grumbling about my circumstances. But these men, filled with the Holy Spirit, they were in song in the midst of their difficult circumstances. So consider your circumstances for a moment. How are things going for you? Are you in song about it? Or are you grumbling and complaining about the circumstances of it? Somehow, when the Holy Spirit is on the situation, Christians can break out in song in the midst of the hardest of times. They can break out in prayer in the neediest of times. That's what's modeled for us in our passage. And so this roughneck, the jailer, he probably is a former military man. Officers like, excuse me, jailers like this man tended to be former military men. Those were the jobs that they would be given. They were privileged jobs. They were good jobs. So he's probably a former, a former Roman soldier. And he's a man of honor. He's a man of duty. And when this earthquake suddenly hits, he's a man of panic. Because even roughnecks, tough men, can have moments of panic when a great earthquake suddenly shakes everything. And he runs into the jail because he has one primary responsibility, and that is the security of those men who are in stocks in the inner cell. As a matter of fact, the law of the day would say that anyone overseeing a prisoner of Rome, should that prisoner escape, they would be put to death for their failure. And so as the jailer runs in after the earthquake, he's in a panic because surely there's a chance that his prisoners have escaped. And if they've escaped, he will die a humiliating death. 
And that's why the passage says he's prepared to fall on his own sword. He knows that death is inevitable. He'd rather fall on his own sword than be humiliated with a public death. But these strange words of grace cry out from Paul and from Silas. No, 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 no. Don't kill yourself. We're all still here. And somehow the Spirit of God, who would have been the cause of that great earthquake, the timing of it, the circumstances of it, the keeping of Paul and Silas and all the prisoners there together, the Holy Spirit would be the doer of these things. That Roman jailer asks the question of all questions. What must I do to be saved? I believe what I'm seeing. I believe what I'm hearing. I've heard you men singing your hymns of praise in the midst of your misery. I've heard the truths that you're echoing. I've heard the people talking about what they've seen. What must a jailer do to be saved? And this is one of those beautiful passages where we're given in such simple words the truth of the gospel. And that's where Paul looks to this jailer and says... Believe the gospel. Repent. Be baptized. And you will be saved. You, and it just gets better, your household. Those who sleep under your roof. Those who identify with you as their head. Your household will be saved. So be baptized. And it's such a free offer. It's such a beautiful offer. It's such a generous offer. And it says that the jailer responds. He wants to wash the wounds of these men who have been beaten and flogged. And maybe he was the one who beat them and flogged them. And now he's tending to their wounds, washing them, caring for them. Just as Lydia's instinct, the first thing she wanted to do was practice hospitality for these men who had brought truth into her heart. Now the jailer, the roughneck, wants to wash and tend the wounds as if he's a nurse, caring for these men that Rome had identified as a problem. This man is converted. He's transformed. Everything he's held to and believed upon and, and made a life out of, he cashes in because he's been converted by the Spirit of God. And you can't manufacture that. You can't make it happen in your own life or in people's lives. It's the Spirit of God working how He will, when He will, where He will, because the wind blows wherever it will, as we heard in our scriptural reflection this morning. And so conversions, these stories of conversions throughout Scripture, particularly in the book of Acts, what we see is that there are similar things in all of these conversions, but every one of them is uniquely different. Now, what's similar and what's different? Here's what's similar. In every conversion of every human person who would cash in their hope and trust for a new hope and trust in the person and the work of Jesus... It's always the Word of God and the Spirit of God working together in the heart of the person to bring that kind of deliverance. Always. It's the Word of God, the good news of God, and the Spirit of God bringing it into the heart, opening Lydia's heart that she would believe. That's what's always similar in every Christian conversion. It's Word and Spirit. But what's different? It's the circumstances by which that happens. That sometimes it's a long, slow, lifelong process. Sometimes it's instantaneous, or it seems to be. But it's always Word and Spirit working in your circumstances. So this is my question for you. Quite simply, have you been converted in any way that sounds similar to this? Have you ever had that experience where everything you grew up holding to and believing in 
you realized it was worth cashing in for a new kind of trust, a new kind of hope, a new kind of confidence that the world did not understand. And it was centered on the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, and you couldn't explain it, but you just knew that's where you wanted to identify. That's where you knew truth to exist. That's what you wanted to embrace anew. That's what conversion is. It's a transformation, a radical transformation that God Himself does through His Word, by His Spirit, inexplicably in the hearts of boys, girls, men, women. Word and Spirit. I'll remind you again, there is a reason why. When we gather together publicly like this, the Word is at the center of everything we do. Scripture is at the center of what we do. From our reflection to our call to worship to the hymns that we sing to obviously the passage that we preach. It's always about the Word. It's always about Jesus. It's always centered on that true truth of who God is and who He says we are and who Jesus ultimately is. That's what it is to be the church according to Scripture. When our youth gather, when our teenagers gather, when our small groups gather, whatever we do as a church, it's all built on word with the trust of the Spirit being at work through that word, converting and growing Christians. That's what it is to be the church according to Scripture. That's part of what it means to be the church according to Scripture. So imagine yourself, if you were that young Jewish boy who from a very young age learned to pray the prayer that sounded something like this. Lord, I thank you that you did not make me to be a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Now there's a reason why he would pray that. Because he was a privileged person. And he was thankful that he would not be shut out to the outer courts as a Gentile. He was thankful that he would be regarded by God as having a leadership role as a male. But imagine being that young Jewish man. Maybe the Apostle Paul himself, who would have prayed, surely would have prayed that prayer, known that prayer. And now being the subject of the conversion of so many people, and in particular, the three stories given to us here by Luke that involve the Apostle Paul. The conversion of a woman named Lydia. The conversion of a slave girl. And the conversion of a Roman Gentile jailer. Consecutively, a woman, a slave, and a Gentile all converted equally by the Word of God and the Spirit of God, shown to be the very kinds of people that God is concerned with, the very kinds of people that make up His church, that make up His kingdom. And suddenly, just like you can look back on things you heard or said when you were a little child, realizing, no, it's just, just not true. The world would tell us that the church thinks little, of women and slaves and Gentiles. But we see in the Scriptures themselves, no, no, it's not true. God and His church and His kingdom have had a large heart for women, for slaves, for Gentiles, for sinners such as us. Luke records this for us because it's such good news. And this morning, I'm calling on you to hear it as good news. To remember these are real people living real lives that make up a real history of being the church. Don't just hear these stories as Sunday school stories. These are real people whose lives were changed. The question is, has your life been changed? Are you a spectator to these conversions? Or have you been a participant in seeing conversions like this radically change your heart? The things that you treasure and value somehow changing 
the things that you want to associate with, somehow changing. That's what conversion is. It's what God does in the lives of His people. It's what God does in His church. Let's pray that would be true of every one of us. Lord, that is our prayer. That with new eyes, we would see what it is to be a woman, a slave, or a Gentile in the kingdom of God. That Jesus calls all kinds of people to himself. And the world would teach us to think in categories that alienate and separate. But the gospel shows us that there is a unity in Christ that transforms humanity. Lord, would that be our heart and our vision at Greenwood Presbyterian Church? That we would see through your eyes how you see your creation. That we would see the power of the gospel and the beauty of the gospel to call a people to yourself. And Lord, would you convert us? Would you transform us with a new love, a new heart, with new passions for the things that you say matter most? And we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen.